Please take your seat. We're going to get started. If everyone could please take a seat. Thank you. We're almost on time. And before we even get started, somebody left their cell phone on the food table. Anybody recognize this? It's got, what does it say? It has something on the back. It says, um, what's it got on the back? The best, oh, this is Save the West Berkeley Shell Mound. Let's get a round of applause for that. But whose phone is this? Nobody in the room? Save the West Berkeley Shell Mound? No, Malcolm doesn't have a cell phone. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, please take your seats. And anyone coming in, save the West Berkeley Shell Mound? Is this your phone? <laughs> okay, well, without further ado, in order to um, start our evening, we're really... Uh, I'll just say, I'm Claire Greensfelder, and I work with Malcolm and Julenny and Lisa and Max and Patricia and a whole team at the California Institute for Community Art and Nature. And um, we're very blessed to have a wonderful group of people here with us tonight, and especially to have a welcome to the David Brower Center by David Brower's son, Ken Brower. Malcolm wanted me to say something about how the center grew out of the, of the 60s. I, I sort of see it. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's uh, well, the first thing was running the gauntlet of the, the Berkeley City Council. We, we got a, a real dose of Berkeley tribalism and, and um, the jihadi bicyclists who um, were enraged that we had a parking garage um, in the basement. David Brower would never have motor vehicles in his building. Of course, my father was, you know, a speed demon on the freeway, and he burned up tons of jet fuel every place he went. And and um, and uh, they didn't know him very well. But um, boy, the, the, but that was an ordeal. You to, to get this building past the hurdles. But the building itself, it's it's um, it's some place between the '60s and a, and a Ebon Longhouse. I'm thinking it, it's a pla places I visited in Borneo, about a mile long. Um, uh, where the ladies dance with the skulls um, of the people's heads they'd taken in, in uh, and except that this is all wrapped around. It's a, it's a community, and um, everything that we hope for this building um, has come true. Uh, uh, we want, it, it, it's, it works slowly, but, but it, um, we began to have the synergy we hope. We, be, we were a bunch of environmental groups. We, we had some cross-pollinization. We had, we had a community place that's grown and grown so that we, all our convention spaces is filled. It's a place to come, and um, and I think I think that is true to the '60s. Thank you, Ken. Is Jesse here? So. So, so Jesse Aragon is the mayor of Berkeley, and he. And there, there, there are several other events tonight, and he's going to, and he's, he, has, he has to go to all of them. <laughs> well, I want to thank Malcolm Margolin. He's really a true Berkeley treasure. And thank him and Claire and the many people that founded the California Institute for Community Art and Nature um, for organizing this important conversation on the impact of the 1960s. It's great to have Fry Gilliard here to thank you for your incredible chronicle of this important era, Hard Rain. I got a copy of the book. I look forward to reading it. And um, it, it may be clear that um, I was not around in the 60s, as <laughs> so you can probably tell. But the events that took place in that generation have had a lasting impact on our society. And it also inspired me personally to dedicate my life to fighting for social justice. As the son and the grandson of migrant farm workers, the work of Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers Movement, which started in this decade, is an inspiration to me. 
the civil rights movement and the many social movements, the Chicano movement, the women's liberation movement, the black power movements, the American Indian movement are all important drivers of social change and inspire the fight for the rights of minority communities to this day. And we know that Berkeley particularly had an important role during this transformative decade. The free speech movement was born here on the UC Berkeley campus. This city was the focus of anti-Vietnam protests and became an epicenter for progressive ideals and for political action. And it's this long, rich history that grew out of the 60s that guides our city's values and our city's work to this day. But the 60s were more than a moment of transformative social change. Everything that happened in that decade, if you really look back and think about it, has had a direct impact on how we live to this day. The scientific breakthroughs, the space race, the role of television in our society, the, the groundbreaking uh, work in, in music and art have really had a transformative impact. And our world is forever changed for the better because of the revolutionary spirit of the 60s. The fight for equality, for our environment, for love and inclusivity are all things that still continue to this day. And the hope and optimism that existed at that time are certainly things that we need now more than ever at this time in our country. We need to reinvigorate the political passion of the 60s now in 2018. And just like Berkeley fought against the Vietnam War and against Governor Reagan, we need to fight against efforts to suppress voting rights. We need to fight against unjust wars and an unjust president. The resistance continues. Thank you. It's such, a it's such a pleasure to have a mayor like this. When I first moved into Berkeley, it was a Republican town. And, and there were all these small town shops and the racism of the place. It, it, what's happened to Berkeley over the years has been marvelous. And I think it, it shaped me. I, um, so the, the, the genesis of this thing is that I'm... I'm so after Heyday, I've, I've created this organization, Cal, the Institute for California, the California Institute for for uh, Community Art and Nature, California I Can, and it's to carry on the work that I started at Heyday Books, and we, we, it, it'll be a series of events. There'll be books, there'll be study centers, and one of the things I wanted was the Center for Berkeley Studies, the Center for BS, <laughs> and. Uh, do, do, do people know what Herb Cain said about Berkeley? It's, it's a great, he was one of those great comments. He says, poor Berkeley, too small to be a city state, too big to be a lunatic asylum. <laughs> but I think we make fun of Berkeley because, it, because it's so great. We, 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 I don't think we have these jokes about San Leandro or about Castro Valley. <laughs> and I think that so and one of the things I'm, I'm trying to figure out is what's made Berkeley so productive in this world? What's made it so innovative? Why has Berkeley been the home of so much good that's happened? This is, this is Las Vegas says what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. What happens in Berkeley spreads throughout the world. <laughs> Before I introduce Barbara, who will introduce uh, Fry, I want to say one other thing. I've spent the last 40 years of my life with California Indians, and, one of, and, one, and I've learned a lot from them. And I think, that it's, and I think the, 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 the saving of the West Berkeley Shell Mound is a major thing. We've got people here who have helped. And I think that we have a sense of, uh, it's, it's California's oldest and deepest sense of itself. And we now have a chance to learn from these people. My friend Vincent Medina is opening a Ohlone Cafe over at uh, Bill McClung's place at University Press Books. We've got the Shell Mound. We've got uh, the Hearst Museum is coming around on things. We, I'm working with some people to bring in an annual event that will have all of the best dancers, the best singers, the best craftspeople in. My, 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 my wonderful friend Julian Brave Noise Cat is, is going to bring in the, um, it's the canoe journey that, that takes place every year in, in, in Puget Sound with this assemblage of boats. And we're going to bring it down to, the, down to San Francisco Bay next year for Alcatraz, the 50th anniversary of Alcatraz. And I think, I think it'll, give you, it'll give you Indians the visibility that they need and it'll give us a chance to learn from them. I think also, 
So, uh, Barbara. This whole, this whole thing is Barbara's fault. <laughs> Shall I introduce Frank? Yeah, introduce Frank. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I first met Fry in his hometown of Mobile, Alabama. We both worked at the University of South Alabama, where he's the writer in residence. We quickly became close friends, collaborative tricksters, creative counterparts. Before I met him, I was already impressed by his bio, realizing he was a prominent and essential voice of the South. Fry has written countless news articles, over 25 books, both fiction and non, on themes from country music to civil rights, for young readers and adults, and he also writes songs. He's not only a chronicler of the times, he's a conveyor of the Southern experience and all, the and all its shortcomings and triumphs. His writings are compelling and impactful because he shares his personal experiences and takes the reader with him on his journey. As I got to know him, I came to realize that Fry has an incredibly generous spirit. And this generosity imbues every aspect of his being. It's central to who he is. And by default, he extends to his readers, helping us understand the South or whatever other subject he tackles on a deeper level, in a holistic way, with our hearts, our heads, and our souls. When he was working on his latest book, A Hard Rain, I was preparing to move to California. He suggested that we head over together to scope it out and do research in Berkeley for his section on the free speech movement. I cherish the memory of our day together at Berkeley University, having coffee at the Free Speech Cafe, and learning about the 60s through his lived experience. So when his book was published and he emailed to see if I might be able to get the ball rolling to help organize an event around his book in Berkeley, I immediately said yes, for many reasons, but first and foremost, for the most selfish reason. I missed him and I wanted to see him. Um, and then I wondered how to get started, and Malcolm immediately came to mind. So Malcolm and his magic team, Claire, Lisa, Max, and many more, came together and brought us all here tonight. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. So thank you. And when I met with the magic team yesterday, they asked that I introduce Fry. And I was really honored, but also very intimidated. I thought, how can I do him justice? And the truth is, I can't. All I can do is give him the stage and let him speak. So please help me welcome Fry Galeon. Thank you, Barbara. It's, uh, it's really an honor for me to be here. Um, the, um, Berkeley was a legend in the 60s in the South where I was. Um, I had never been here until I was researching the book, and so the day that Barbara and I spent on this campus was the first time I'd ever been to Berkeley or to UC Berkeley. And we went into the Free Speech Movement Cafe and looked at the plaques and the pictures on the walls, and I was, I was really kind of stunned. I had known about the Free Speech Movement. I was in college at the same time. It was presented, though, through the media as a, as a kind of uh, act of sort of wild-eyed radicalism. Uh, students who were willing to um, take over buildings and sit in and all this kind of stuff. And I knew better. I knew that narrative was missing a lot. But I had not grasped the kind of depth of idealism of the movement until I walked into that cafe and read these words from Mario Savio on the wall. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And unless you, and, and you've got to indicate to the people who run it to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will, not, will be prevented from working at all. I, I read that and I thought, 
this is Martin Luther King territory. Uh, not only in eloquence, but in the sort of grounded sense of idealism that those words, um, that those words contained. Later, I went to the library and I began to read through some of the primary source material that the Berkeley Library contained, and I got Robert Cohen's book, Freedom's Orator, about Savio, and learned, in fact, that there, was, there had been a direct connection between him and others involved in this free speech movement, and the uh, Freedom Summer in Mississippi in 1964, and the uh, political organizing that followed in the fall of 1964, David Harris was there uh, for some of that. My own experience, my own entry into the 1960s um, came through the Southern Civil Rights Movement. I grew up in Alabama. I grew up in Mobile uh, on the Gulf Coast in a very uh, conservative white Southern family. They were not mean people, but they were very much a part of the status quo. And to the extent that I had thought about things in the early 60s, I kind of regarded myself that way. And yet things kept happening that were disturbing. Uh, the students began sitting in at lunch counters in Greensboro and Nashville and more than 50 other cities around the South. And their dignity and their poise and their, uh, the depth of their idealism was such an affront to the people who came to try to intimidate and harass. Um, and then I listened to the music that was starting to, uh, to come out. Um, Joan Baez came to Mobile um, either 1962 or 63. She came to Spring Hill College, which was a Jesuit college across the street from where I grew up. And she chose that as her destination because it had desegregated back in the 1940s and had been mentioned by Martin Luther King in his letter from a Birmingham jail. And I remember her walking down with bare feet singing Kumbaya, and I was 15 years old, and it was just an incredibly mesmerizing thing. But the transformative moment for me uh, came in April of 1963. And I was on a high school field trip from Mobile to Birmingham, and I saw Martin Luther King arrested. It was the arrest that led him to write the letter from a Birmingham jail. I didn't go to Birmingham because of the civil rights movement, was because there were demonstrations. I was vaguely aware, but, uh, but only vaguely. But there was Dr. King being shoved along up a sidewalk uh, by two burly Birmingham policemen who seemed to be enjoying their work. They weren't quite brutal, but they were disrespectful and they were rough. One of them had Dr. King by the collar of the shirt and the other by the loop on the belt in the back of his, uh, the jeans that he was wearing, and they were shoving him roughly along. And I don't know what I expected to see on his face as he passed uh, within, as far as for me to Malcolm from where I was standing, uh, just by pure happenstance. I maybe was expecting to see anger. I think I would have been angry. Uh, maybe I was expecting to see fear. It scared me a little bit as a kid watching this. But what I thought I saw instead was this sort of deep well of sadness in his large, dark, expressive eyes. And for me, from that point on, the 60s and the movements for social change had a face, and it was the face of Martin Luther King, and I couldn't get it out of my mind. And I later came to think of that period of time, <coughs> and have written about it in the, in the book, A Hard Rain, this way, that there were kind of parallel story arcs that, that took shape during that time. And one of them was the arc of optimism, the arc of change, the arc of idealism, the belief that we could take this country and make it better. And whether that had to do with civil rights or later black power, whether it had to do with the women's movement that gained momentum during that time, whether it had to do with the environmental movement that gained so much strength in this part of the country, uh, whether it had to do with the farm workers in California, or whatever uh, the other dimensions, the American Indian movement that took shape by the latter part of the decade and is what I write about in the last chapter called Redemption. Um, whatever it was, there was that story arc of the decade. And I think it still 
is part of us today. I mean, I think there are echoes or ripples through our body politic and our national spirit or whatever uh, you want to call it. But there was another arc back then, and it was darker. Um, it was the arc of violence. It was the arc of war. It was the arc of Vietnam. Um, it was the arc of division um, and the arc of assassination. Um, and so those two realities kind of paralleled each other and all sorts of other things interwove, you know, the music and the, the uh, art and the movies and the cultural dimensions to change. All of that was part of it. But somehow to me, those two arcs seem to me to be the, uh, the defining qualities of the decade. And the question for us today, I think, is which one is going to be most powerful in our lives today, because I think we see both in our country. I want to close the opening remarks very quickly by, uh, by reading just a short passage that has to do with both of those arcs at the same time and ends with the most profound question that I think we are left with today and maybe we'll talk about some tonight. This is something that happened on April 4th 1968, and it'll be familiar to many of you, I think. Robert Kennedy was on his way to Indianapolis when he heard the news. He was beginning his presidential campaign in Indiana, a primary he knew he had to win, much as his brother in 1960 had needed to win in West Virginia, that economically ravaged backwater of Appalachia, where JFK laid to rest the idea that a Catholic could not win in the heartland. Now in Indiana, the younger Kennedy would have to earn the votes of alienated whites, many of whom had voted for George Wallace in 1964. RFK as a champion of the poor and dispossessed, of blacks and Indians and Mexican Americans, knew he faced an uphill climb, but he also knew, both personally and politically, that he could not turn his back on the ghetto, and that was where he began. On the flight to Indianapolis for a scheduled rally in the inner city, a New York Times reporter told Kennedy that Martin Luther King had been shot. By the time the plane landed, they knew King had died. Jack Newfield reported that Kennedy wept, perhaps for the country, perhaps in private memory of his brother, though his grief, in a sense, was more generic than personal. He did not know Dr. King well. The two, by most accounts, never quite understood or trusted each other. But Kennedy did understand King's importance for African Americans. When police officials in Indianapolis warned him not to venture into the ghetto, for on this night especially it would be too dangerous for any white man to be there, Kennedy brushed the warnings aside. Even when the police refused to go with him or to offer protection, Kennedy forged ahead. He found a crowd of a thousand people waiting, milling around, hunched against the cold. Remarkably, in this era before the cable news cycle, they did not yet know that King had been shot. It fell to Robert Kennedy to tell them. Standing on a flatbed truck, wearing an oversized coat that once belonged to his brother, he began in a flat, somber voice. I have some bad news for you, for all our fellow, fellow citizens and people who love justice all over the world, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and killed tonight. As Kennedy biographer, Ev biographer Evan Thomas recounted, there was a collective gasp and shouts of no, no. Kennedy pushed, Kennedy paused briefly and then pushed ahead. He had scribbled some notes before he arrived, but he paid no attention to them now. The word simply came. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice for his fellow human beings, and he died because of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it is perhaps well to ask what kind of nation we are and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence there evidently is that there were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness, with hatred, and a desire for revenge, we can move in that direction as a country in great polarization, black people amongst black, white people amongst white, filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, 
to understand and to comprehend and to replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that is spread across our land with an effort to understand with compassion and love. For those of you who are black and are tempted to be filled with hatred and distrust at the injustice of such an act against all white people, I can only say that I feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, and he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poet was Aeschylus. He wrote, in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. Robert Kennedy's voice was stilled not too long after that, but the wisdom is still there. And the question is, how do we find it, keep it alive, because we need it now more than ever. Thank you. So thank you so much, Fry. And just to let you know, the next section of our program will be our first panel, moderated by Susan Griffin, and she'll introduce the various speakers, and then we'll take a brief break, and then we'll have a second panel. So, Malcolm, anything else you want to say? And there are so many people in this room that deserve to be up here. I would, I would, I'd love to hear from everybody here. And it's clearly impossible, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll try to keep this brief so we can have some time outside. And uh, s s I, I'm, I'm afraid of pointing out the people here because some of them are my real heroes. But, and, I, and I'll probably miss some. But we'll keep this short and, and hopefully have some time outside. So, so just the last thing, yes, we have an hour afterwards and seats reserved outside for you all to meet with the folks who are speaking one-on-one. -on -one. So take it away, Susan. Okay, is my mic on? Okay, good, good. So uh, we're, we're each gonna speak uh, just briefly and then we'll have a little bit of discussion and then There'll be some other, there'll be a break and then there'll be another panel. So, and then we'll talk with you outside. Um, so I'm gonna start us off here. Uh, we, we were really given a couple of questions by, by Malcolm. Uh, they're, they're complex questions, but to simplify things, it's basically what were the values, what's, what's the meaning of the 60s that we took away with us that we still have with us, and how can we pass this on? And anybody who wants to, when you speak, to alter that, you can <laughs> alter those two points. But that's what I took away from, from what M Malcolm was saying, and I, I think they're great, they're great questions. Um, and uh, for, for me, one of the things that was, I think, really centrally important in the 60s was the changing of terms. Um, the 60s, for me, really began in the 50s. Uh, those of you who, I, a lot of you, you know, are old enough to remember the 50s. And um, one of the things that was happening in our political world was the House of Un-American Activities Committee and the Senate hearings with Joseph McCarthy and then also the Un-American Activities Committee. And um, one of the first forms of demonstration uh, in the country, I think, happened at UC Berkeley, and that was the demonstration against HUAC, or the House of Un-American Activities Committee. And that, that paved the way. That paved the way for, for so much else that happened. Political events and events that are not considered political but are vastly, ch uh, vastly changed uh, the, the landscape of our consciousness. Um, so one of the terms that was uh, used quite a lot and, and used to ruin people's lives and hurl all kinds of accusations was this term un-American. And it's, it's so much parallel to make America great again, you know, this kind of, as if there, there is a kind of uh, right American and wrong American or non-American. Um, but I think also the very act of standing up and speaking out is uh, liberating um, of more than just what you're standing up for. So that, um, you know, when we, when we began to voice our protest against the House of Un-American Activities Committee, which had cowed people. I mean, people, 
my, my, uh, my own adoptive family, I was adopted as a teenager by ex-communists, and they, um, they left the country. They went to Mexico. They were that frightened. My, uh, my ex-husband's family also went to Mexico. They, they were Humphrey liberals, and, but they were Jewish. And they were afraid, and they, and they moved to Mexico. So that's how much the American landscape was gripped by a sort of terror. And things started to change when people stood up and spoke out. Um, one of the people, of course, was the military man. I can't remember his name, but he said, you know, have you no shame? Have you no shame, Senator McCarthy? And that, that shifted the whole political landscape right there. But standing up as students, uh, if you've seen Berkeley in the 60s, students who were washed down the steps of City Hall protesting the House of an American changed the whole atmosphere, so that then speech, speech got liberated. And, and when speech is liberated, consciousness is liberated. You have different dreams. You see things that you hadn't seen before. And I think the women's movement would not have been possible had we not stood up to uh, the House of Un-American Activities Committee. We got the habit of standing up for what was right. And then that happened also, it was happening contiguously, it was happening at the same time in the South, the very important civil rights movement, which inspired all of us. It was profoundly inspiring, even if you didn't go South and join the freedom rights or the, or the, or the uh, lunch counter sit-ins. Uh, still, to see about, read about that in the news or send support, as we were doing from Berkeley, shifted your whole consciousness. You know, you do not have to put up with things as they are if they are wrong. And, and um, there's a lot of talk about LSD and psychedelics and how that shifted consciousness, and I think that's true. I never took any of those things. I took marijuana once. I had an hallucinogenic experience in marijuana, but that's not what shifted my, my consciousness. It was standing up and speaking out that shifted my consciousness. There's one thing that I, I love about, about um, Hard Rain in the book, um, is that um, you mention uh, Lillian Smith. One of the things the women's movement did, and, the Af and before that, the, the civil rights movement, began to rewrite history. So it's not only the present that you see differently, but you start to read history differently, so that in the women's movement, we began to discover women whom we had not heard of before, who, whose lives, whose literature, whose writing, whose art had not been taught in the university classes we went to. The only two writers, and I was very grateful for these two, uh, that, that, that were women that, that I encountered in undergraduate literature courses were Virginia Woolf and uh, Emily Dickinson. And suddenly, there was this incredible enthusiasm and rediscovery of, of a whole number of women who had produced things in the arts. And of course, the same thing happened in the civil rights movement with uh, African American culture. So um, I'm going to end my remarks there with the sense that uh, one of the things that happened in the 60s was that consciousness got liberated in many different directions all at once. And, we're, and so, um, Adam, do you want to go next? Great. So, uh, I'm Adam Hochschild, and from the 60s, I would like to take two memories and one hope. The first memory is of being at the age of 21 or 22 in August 1963 on the mall in Washington, D.C., and hearing there on the spot Martin Luther King uh, give his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, there were 250,000 people there. Uh, I don't think we all fully realized what a historic moment that was, but there was some sense that we were seeing the signs of something that had never been seen before in this country. What I so much admire about Dr. King was this. Uh, not only was he an inspiring leader of the civil rights movement, for which he was uh, beaten and roughed up, as, as Fry described, uh, jailed many times, 
But several years after that historic speech, he spoke out very strongly against the war in Vietnam. Much to the upset and outrage of many mainstream liberals who thought civil rights was fine and maybe the war wasn't a good idea, but you shouldn't get these ideas mixed up with each other. It would somehow hurt the movement. But King expanded. He saw that stopping that war was part of the same struggle for social justice. When he was killed, he had gone to Tennessee to take part in a labor struggle. It was a strike of sanitation workers. I like to think that if he had lived a few years longer, if he had been allowed to live a few years longer, he would have understood that the women's movement, which really began to shake the, the country and the world in 1969, was also part of that same broad spectrum struggle for social justice. So from him, I take that lesson that the road to justice in all its forms is a very, very wide one. Second memory from the 1960s, free speech movement, 1964. Uh, one of the crucial events, which those of you who've lived through it will remember, is that uh, a little bit before Mario Savio gave his great speech, which uh, Fry uh, read a quotation from, a couple weeks before that, there was an episode when Jack Weinberg, a student protester, was arrested in Sproul Plaza. They sent in a police car to uh, take him away, and a huge crowd of students, ultimately thousands of them, surrounded the police car, and it was stalled there with Jack Weinberg in it for 32 hours. Well, during that time, Many, many people, one after another, somebody brought a public address system and got up on top of the police car and made speeches to the crowd. And I was there watching. And I remember at one point, a guy climbed up on the car, took the microphone, started to speak, and he was a very sort of tough-looking, crew-cut young man. And he said, I've just arrived at Berkeley because after spending four years in the U.S. Marine Corps. And I joined the Marine Corps to fight for my country and freedom. And you could sort of hear a couple of thousand hearts sinking in the crowd, thinking, oh my God, somebody from the other side has gotten up in the police car. Where is this going to go? And then he continued and he said, I'm here today because I am still fighting for my country and for freedom. And the crowd roared. And the lesson I took away from that was sometimes you've got allies where you don't think you're going to have them. My hope that I take away from the 60s is that we can change the world. We changed a lot. We got that war stopped in Vietnam. We got the United States out of that war. Uh, at the beginning of the 1960s, uh, very, very few black people in the Deep South were able to vote. There were long struggles. There were civil rights workers who went south. Uh, I was one of them briefly. Uh, there were people killed. There were arrests. There were great marches. And the Civil Rights Act got passed. The Voting Rights got Act got passed. The right to vote is very much under threat today, but people at the beginning of the 1960s would have been amazed to hear that there would come a time when uh, a black candidate could come within a few percentage points of winning statewide office in Georgia or in Florida. So some things got accomplished in that decade, and that's the spirit of hope that I'd like to take away from it. I'm David Harris. Uh, when the 60s started, uh, I was Fresno High School's Boy of the Year. <laughs> I went on to become a civil rights worker in Mississippi, Stanford's radical student body president, and helped found the draft resistance movement. And by the end of the 60s, I had spent almost two years in federal prison 
most of it on a maximum security cell block. So sitting here as an old fart, <laughs> trying to look back and figure out, well, what did we learn in that whole process? I made myself a little list of six things, or six lessons I feel like I learned. The first is that evil is participatory and we're all responsible for it. There are no bystanders. To do nothing is to choose a side. Second, we are never powerless. Even in the worst of circumstances, we all control our behavior. Third, we are never isolated. We are all people, and people spend a great deal of time watching other people trying to figure out what to do. Everybody has a constituency. It's in that simple fact that politics are born. Fourth, you get what you do in life. Reality is not a function of what you say. Reality has, is a function of acting. And values that are not translated into behavior don't exist. Fifth, people change. If we offer them the opportunity to do so. Movements do not succeed by drawing lines in the sand. Movements succeed by being open on all sides, prepared to incorporate any new members that show up. And they do show up. All of us in the 60s changed. Nobody started out like this. <laughs> and finally, Whatever the risks or the punishment or the price you have to pay, you are a net winner by acting out what is right and good and true. You cannot lose in that proposition. You may suffer, but you cannot lose. My name's Peter Coyote, and um, I want to build on something that David said instead of I'll just give you enough of a background that there were two sides in my 60s. One side was an overtly political side, and one side was an overtly cultural side. And I tried to walk both of them due to complicated circumstances. My 60s began in the 50s. I was raised for 12 years by an African-American family, and I saw the civil rights struggles through their eyes. I came from a family of Jewish communists and socialists, and I saw the McCarthy period through their eyes, and I've never saluted the flag since I was 10 years old. I say that because they lied about my relatives. So when I came to the 60s, I felt responsible to African-American struggles. I'm proud to say the first two issues of the Black Panther Party newspaper were printed in my house on stolen Gestetner machines. <laughs> I'm proud to say that I used to be a marksman and a, a hunter, and I dove into the white gun culture and Mountain View and used to buy guns for Eldridge Cleaver. But that was not a path I chose to pursue, and I chose to pursue a cultural path. And from that cultural path, we can take a lot of um, pride in the movements that evolved. Organic food movement, the women's movement, civil rights movement, alternative health practices, alternative spiritual practices. People are now living those realities all over the United States. There's no place you can't go to find organic food or a women's movement or environmental movement. But I think my time here today would be better spent talking about mistakes I made and mistakes my peers made because I would not like to see them made by those of you under 60 in this room. <laughs> 
both of you. <laughs> so one of the things that stands out in retrospect is that my peers' insistence on being a counterculture with our own way of dressing, our own use of drugs, free love, experimentation, trying to build, honestly, a culture in which we could be authentic people. That was the positive side, but it had a shadow side. And the shadow side was that there were lots of people who were not being bandaged where they were wounded, but we could not make common cause with them. They didn't want their children in our communal houses, witnessing people getting high or fucking on the kitchen table. They were just conservative people, and they were good people, and they were our people, and it was our failing that we couldn't acknowledge and honor their cultures. And so since democracy is a numbers game, we failed to accrue the kind of numbers that we needed. That was a mistake. And I say this because I see something of the same mistake being repeated today. A protest is an invitation to live in a kinder, better, more just and equitable world. And my model for protest has always been and remains the civil rights African-American people who came well-dressed, with unflinchable courage, with unbreakable dignity. The only time they raised their voices was to sing. And they were playing for the largest audience. Every act of protest is a theater. And you're not playing your theater for six white men in Washington. You're playing your theater for the United States. And you're not going to get it by screaming at a senator in an elevator, even though those women are my sisters. And I understand and I, I know why they're angry. But the people looking at them in Nebraska and Ohio who have never had the entitlement or the power to scream at a public figure, they say, those are not my people. So in times as pressing as these, I think we have to realize that we're playing a long chess game. And if we're not careful that identity politics will create the same kind of marginalizing counterculture that we did. If we were going to make a long playing album of democratic progressive policies, of course, there would be cuts on those albums for race and gender and sexuality and all the identity issues that we front. But that would not be the cover of the album or we would not win the numbers we need to take power. The cover of the album would have to deal with things like health care, uh, tariff, uh, tariff adjustments, in other words, money to retrain workers who've been displaced by globalism. The United States spends less on those people than any developed country in the world. That's where a lot of the rage that produced Trump came from. That's on the Democrats as well as the Republican, who for 50 years have abandoned rural people, working people, unions, teachers. That's where that rage has been building. The cover of that album would have to include infrastructure repair, building the wealth for our grandchildren, just as we receive the wealth from our grandparents. So I think we're in for a long chess game, and I think that harnessing our anger and turning it into skillful means, it's a great Buddhist phrase. You can be enlightened, you can know everything, but if you don't have skillful means, you can't communicate it to other people. General Mattis gave the game away. He said, be courteous, be polite, and have a plan to kill everyone you meet. <laughs> so that's who we're playing against. And no one responded, no one in leadership in Washington responded to the slaughters in Rwanda, responded to the slaughters in Bosnia, Herzegovina, responded to Auschwitz until they were forced into it. So they're not going to respond to your outrage or my outrage about identity issues. Those are mosquito bites compared to that suffering. So if we don't want to be memes of history, we have to be disciplined. 
And we have to understand that every act of protest is theater. I keep wondering what would have happened if the women in the elevator and in the hearing room for Christine Blasey Ford had all worn shirts that said mother, wife, sister, daughter, had black bandanas around their mouths. They would never have been thrown out of the room. Every time you saw the audience, you would have seen those people. But to be dragged out screaming a few incoherent phrases, I applaud them, I applaud the courage, but the people who are your audience don't. So I think that was our major mistake. And I've just been teaching in the East Coast and talking about this and trying to urge young people to channel that anger into skillful practices and good theater. We are the media generation. We know how to do this. We can control the message by the media. And we just need to remember that we're playing for the entire United States of America. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ana de Leon. I'm listed as Chantus and school board member. While it's true I'm a singer, I haven't been a school board member for about 20 years. But what I have, I hope, been is a troublemaker. I think each of us brought who we are to the 60s. So how, who I was was a little bit different, well, than many here, I think. I'm, my mother was Puerto Rican and my father a first-generation Estonian army man. They met in Puerto Rico when he was stationed there. On my birth certificate, he's described as white, my mother is described as Spanish, and I am a blank space. <laughs> Which I, um, I think of actually as a comment on just basic racism. Similarly, when I married a black man in the 60s, it was an illegal thing to do, and I knew that, but it, uh, it was before Loving v. Virginia. So I would say, having come from a poor background, lived in the first desegregated housing project, which was in Los Angeles, and then from there, lived my life as a normal, poor or working class person with clear racial views, that I saw the 60s somewhat differently. For me, the 60s was the time of Ray Charles, of um, Sam Cooke, of the Soul Stirrers, of, of the, all the gospel music I loved, all the rhythm and blues that I loved, that spoke to me, that spoke to my heart. And what I did notice, though, is that the 60s also seemed to be a place where white people actually opened their hearts. And to me, and had fun that fun was something people really aspired to, and hearts open was also something that people aspired to. And I had not seen that before. But I wasn't a participant in any of the, um, well, things that most people were doing politically. I wouldn't have called myself a political person. I was basically marginally an LA music person, poet. I did get a degree in I got a master's actually in painting because I was on a war orphans bill that allowed me to get money to go to school. But it wasn't because I participated in college activities. I never thought of myself as a college girl. I thought of myself as other things that I did to earn a living so that I could pay my rent and put food on the table. But none of them would I have described as political. Now, however, when I had an interracial child, clearly interracial, and thought about where to raise her after having her called a nigger in the park in Los Angeles and a variety of experiences that were really unpleasant. Berkeley was the first city in all of the United States that desegregated its schools. And that's why I moved here. That was the reason, I didn't know a soul. But I thought, gee, you know, if Berkeley chose to desegregate its schools and defeated a recall, that is my kind of place. Whoever those people are, they are pretty wonderful people. And so I have to thank all of you because probably lots of you had something to do with that, looking at the color of your hair. <laughs>
So while here, I became an overtly political person. I've been a civil rights lawyer. I've had jazz clubs. I've still done all the things, looking for the shiny objects that I seem to always look for. But, um, but I would say I am overtly political. I learned about politics here, even as I stood in groups of people where they talked about all their activities at Columbia and Berkeley, and I had none of those activities, but I did find them interesting. So now I sing mostly, and I thought there are a lot of words tonight, and I'm just gonna put less, we'll say fewer than two minutes of song. And they're from, the, these two little snippets of song are from songs of struggle. Some of you know, they came out of gospel songs though. Most of the songs that we think of as songs from the freedom movement are really gospel songs. And this song, that starts with, soon and very soon, it originally was, I'm going to see the king, meaning that guy up there. But the movement changed it a little bit, and so I'll just sing a little bit of it. Soon and very soon, we are going to change this world. No more suffering here. We are going to change the world. Peace and justice here. We are going to change this world. Forever and ever, we are going to change the world. As soon as the killing of the black man, the black Mother, son, is as important as the killing of the white man. The white mother, son. You know we who believe in freedom shall not rest. No, no. Well, we who believe in freedom shall not rest until it comes. Thank you. Well, now we're going to have a little bit of crosstalk among the, the panelists here. And uh, so I'm going to start with a little something. Is, is that all right? Fine is, by me. Is that, okay, good. Good. Um, Peter, I so agree with you about skillful means, but I don't about identity politics. So I, I just want to introduce the, the, the idea that a lot of people who are, you know, those of us who are put in, thrust into the position where we have to fight for our identity somehow, which is not necessarily by choice, but that we're just thrust into that position. And, and to fight for women's rights, you have to gather together as women. That's what we had to do. And African American people had to gather together as people, and people of color had to gather together to create change. And that's identity politics, but we didn't invent the identity. The identity was thrust upon us. And I, I believe that's a term that's used, um, used to suppress people's movements, basically. But I so agree about skillful means. I think that um, it's my argument with the Green Party, for instance, that we need to have strategies. We need to have a plan for what we're doing that's going to be effective. And we don't want to alienate people. I completely agree with you about that. We don't want to alienate people unnecessarily. So anyway, I'd love to have your, your response to that. Well, I would, certainly, I would certainly never suggest that anyone's identity is illicit or shouldn't be spoken no, I to. I know you weren't saying that. Uh, well, I just wanted to be clear that what I mean when I use the word identity politics is if the Democratic Party simply gets associated in the public mind as the party of sex, race, and gender, we are consigning ourselves to a minority that will not win political power. So the, the theater of identity politics has to be done very carefully and skillfully. So there's a big, the reason that I, I suggested, suppose the women in the elevator with Jeff Flake had once again been wearing 
black shirts that said sister, mother, lover, and instead of screaming at him, just kept saying, don't be frightened. Don't be frightened. Don't be frightened. It would have engendered a dialogue. People would have had to figure out, what do they mean? Why are they saying that? So I'm just saying that the Democratic Party is losing certain kinds of footing by fronting identity politics as its major logo instead of coming up with a big tent that includes them. So I'm just going to say, push yeah, push back. <laughs> I'm going to push back. Because today, Nancy Pelosi gave a wonderful speech, and the emphasis was on uh, the failure of the country to support working people. And that was where the emphasis uh -huh. was. So I don't think it's the Democratic Party doing that. I think it's, and I think, I also feel that I, not to blame the media, but what gets popularized, you know, somehow through some, you know, partly media, not all media, because I'm very grateful to so many reporters. But, but the very big popular media, including Fox News, is the idea that these issues are separate and it's, it's very hard to connect them. And I mean, it's not hard conceptually, but it's hard in print to do that. I don't know if any of you here are working writers or working, uh, you know, once you, you can, you know, as a feminist, it's easy for me to publish a book if I'm gonna write about rape. But if I say, I'm writing about rape and fascism, which is what I'm writing about now, it's a hard sell. Because they, you know, they don't wanna understand that. But I think those connections are what we need to make. So I don't want, the last thing I'm going to say, I don't want to bogart the mic, but I think that the Democratic Party has woken up to the fact that they are equally responsible for the election of Trump. And I think the media has woken up to the fact that the billions of f dollars of free airtime they gave him oh, elected yes. Donald Trump, even as it fattened the coffers of their institutions. Absolutely. So if you just go back to... Jimmy Carter's Fed guy, Paul Volcker, who raised interest rates five points in a day and bankrupted 22 million farmers, family farmers. There's some Trump voters. Then just go five years forward to the savings and loan scandal, $280 billion of personal savings. There's some Trump voters. Less than 10 years later, Clinton ends Glass-Steagall, liberates the banks, collapses the economy, and the people that should have gone to jail supported Obama. So suddenly Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats are waking up to the fact that this cauldron that's stirring out in the middle of the country is partially their responsibility. I think it is the Democratic Party. Well, I, I Party. think Pelosi has been awake to that for quite a while. But, but anyway, can, uh, but, but I, I agree with you in principle. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I isn't, Yeah. Isn't the issue accessibility? If you're going to have a movement, it has to be accessible. And as you portray yourself, you're going to have to portray yourself in ways that make you accessible to the people that you're trying to reach. I mean, in the 60s, uh, that same issue arose around the question of calling policemen pigs. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. My yes. attitude was, we're trying to organize the police. Yeah. We went to high school with those guys. There's no reason that we have to be on the opposite side. And, but we're not going to be on the same side if we're calling them pigs. It's just not going to happen. And uh, I think uh, those of us who are conscious of it have to be conscious of presenting ourselves to other people in ways that allow other people to reach back towards us. It's, you know, you don't say you're on our side or you're against us. You never say that you in a never moment, say that. not if you yeah. want to succeed, because yeah. well, you're freezing yourself in place as soon as you draw that line. One way of saying that is that your anger has to come out of love, not hatred. For, for me, but one way of saying it is that we have to deal with everybody as though they were human beings who live in our house yeah. and we care for them. Yeah. And, and and particularly, uh, p policemen are, are working class often, most of the time. Well, I, I think you gotta treat rich people nice, too. Yeah. <laughs> Susan, why don't you, if folks could make their sort of concluding comments, that would be great. What? 
your time. So it would be great oh, to hear from the other panelists. Oh, oh we're, we're finished. Oh, we used our time. You did. No. So uh, oh, okay. could, maybe a couple of comments from the others who haven't spoken, and then because yeah. we have a spectacular oops, second panel ready to come up. I really don't have anything to add to what Peter said uh, about uh, any kind of political activity is a performance, and you've got to think about your audience, and too few of us do that. So I only think none of us really understand why anybody would support Trump. I don't think, I think it's some sort of basic, deep, psych psychological chasm between those who find him completely revolting and those who support him. And the two sides have a very hard time ever coming to grips with understanding each other. I don't have the answer, but I do think there's something in the psychology of all this that is the crux of it. Maybe everybody needs to do Tai Chi. Everybody. I'm not sure. <laughs> or sing. Or sing for sure. Yeah. So, so, my, so my, sense, my sense of it is that, it's, that I think it's, a, it's election time and we, we, we're thinking about winning and losing. I think there was something bigger at stake in the, in the 60s. And there was something like truth and there was something like I don't think we're just playing to the media. I think that what gives, what gives Savio's speech its power is it came from the heart. I think what gave, I think we were willing to experiment widely. I think we were willing to experiment with our lives. I think there was something about the way we related to one another that wasn't just about winning and losing. I think there was something bigger at stake. And I, think, I think that's what we have to get back to. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful. Yes, okay. So I'd like to call up the second panel. And while we do that, Max, could you come forward? Um, Scoop Nisker and let's see, who else? Is, and, um, and Fry and our dear friend Arnold Perkins. OK. And um, also, we have Sashin. Were you able to make it? Someone told me you're here. Is Sashin Littlefeather here? No, I don't think so. OK, we, we're going to share a, a video of Sashin. But also, before you go, John Knox, if you would come forward. And if I could get our, uh, Fry, would you? Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, Fry, this is Arnold Perkins. Where's John Knox? Okay. We're so grateful to all of you for coming here tonight. And if we could have your attention, John Knox is the executive director John Knox is the executive director of Earth Island Institute for many years, co-executive director, and really is partly responsible for the California Institute for Community Art and Nature being a sponsored project here. And he's going to tell you a little bit about why they decided to uh, take on Malcolm and his second generation uh, venture. Hi, folks. Uh, another amazing evening at the Brower Center. Thank you. Um, Ken was uh, good enough to uh, welcome you all as a board member from the Brower Center, and the Brower Center does see itself as a home for the environmental movement, and we're all working to help the Brower Center fulfill that vision. Uh, just to make clear, also here at the Brower Center is up on the fourth floor Earth Island Institute. And um, in much the same way that the Brower Center came out of the work and vision of David Brower, uh, so did Earth Island. And uh, we're something like 35 years old now, and we've been a place over the years to help folks who have a vision for doing something in the world uh, to realize those visions. And uh, we're so happy to have um, California ICANN is one of our projects. We have about 80 projects at Earth Island. Some project folks are here in the room, Toby McLeod among them. Uh, Toby's been with us for more than 30 years. So, um, and then we have a lot of 20-somethings and uh, we love helping people 
to use the resources, the shared resources of Earth Island Institute to um, chase their dreams and to have impact in the world. Um, we've realized lately that we have a new generation of leaders who are doing late life chapters. And I think that would be what we would talk about with Malcolm. Malcolm has had this amazing run doing things through Heyday, and now it's a new chapter. Um, we love dealing with young people of all ages, and, <laughs> and, and I just think sometimes of something that Dave Brower said late in his life. Uh, of course, he had actually published the book called In Wildness is the Preservation of the World, um, which was a combination of Elliot Porter photographs and um, uh, Henry David Thoreau language. Uh, but he said, he's late in life, he was thinking that we really need to look at this whole question of wildness. And I think that's what we're doing. We're looking at wild people and helping them to follow the genius of wildness in not only working with the natural world, but also working with wild ideas because that's what's going to help us to preserve the world. So thank you again so much for coming and thank you for helping us make California ICANN a real force in the world. And we're hoping that, uh, oh, Ken, we want you to be part of this panel, that Frederica Newton will be able to join us. She's trying to get here after work if she can. Um, and everyone was given an envelope on your way in, and David Goins. Um, if you are moved to see the kinds of work that Malcolm has been promoting, incredible uh, support of our California Native community, the upcoming Alcatraz canoe journey that he was speaking about being organized by Freddie. Hi. <laughs> Um, it, uh, Julian Brave Noise Cat and others. And uh, we're also thinking about doing a conference because this topic is so rich and deep that uh, perhaps next year a two or three day conference on, in fact, the 60s, what you would take, what you'd leave behind, and where do we go now that has lots of time for interaction and many, many of the rich panel of speakers that we could have tonight, we could have 10 times as many, which could be fabulous. So please uh, fill out the questionnaire that we passed to you in the program, but also if you're moved to make a donation to help keep this work going forward, we'd really appreciate that as well. And with that, um, we're going to launch the second section with uh, Sasheen Littlefeather on video, since she couldn't join us today, to give us kind of a, a I guess a, an, another sense of the a moment in the 60s that is uh, will be hard to forget. So Max, could you come up and launch this video? I learned a great deal from a director named Ingmar Bergman. Often to be most eloquent is to be silent. You're quite right. Uh, the film we've just seen has said it all. I think we should uh, say that those nominated for the best performance by an actor are... Marlon Brando in The Godfather. Michael Caine in Sleuth. Laurence Olivier in Sleuth. Peter O'Toole in The Ruling Class. Paul Winfield in Sounder. The winner is... Marlon Brando in The Godfather. Accepting the award for Marlon Brando and the Godfather, Miss Shasheen Littlefeather. Hello, my name is Sasheen Littlefeather. I'm Apache and I'm president of the National Native American Affirmative Image Committee. I'm representing Marlon Brando this evening and he has asked me to tell you in a very long speech, which I cannot share with you presently because of time, but I will be glad to share with the press afterwards, that he very regretfully cannot accept this very generous award. And the reasons for this being are the treatment of American Indians today by the film industry, 
Excuse me. And on television, in movie reruns, and also with recent happenings at Wounded Knee. I beg at this time that I have not intruded upon this evening, and that we will, in the future, our hearts and our understandings will meet with love and generosity. Thank you on behalf of Marlon Brando. So we're ready to start the second panel then, correct? Claire, we ready to go? Okay, good. Well, I just want to say, um, as the person here not from Berkeley, that there's a lot of wisdom in this room tonight. Um, the last panel, um, people said things that uh, I had not thought of, and that's always a good sign, I think. It makes us all think. So wish that for this current panel and maybe the way to do it is just come start over there and just come on down the line. Introduce yourself and then just offer your thoughts on the on the 60s, your part of it, your what you think needs to be carried forward or left behind or both. I think they're all um well first of all I'd like to say I'm most uncomfortable in this. I had no idea I'd be sitting in front of a panel in front of um, so many people tonight. Anybody that knows me knows this is just not my shtick. But um, I feel like I'm at home. Most of you look like folks I grew up with here in Berkeley, just a few more gray hairs or less hair. But I'm Frederica um, Newton. My husband was Huey Newton. My mother was Arlene Slaughter. And, um, and yeah, I had big shoes to fill, which I, um, which has been with me for most of my life. Um, my mother and my father got married in the 50s when it was illegal. I, my father was black and my mother was Jewish. And um, I had a brother, a half-brother, Mickey, from my mother's first marriage. So even though we lived in Berkeley, there was my mother and my father, who was a jazz musician, who wore his hair processed, and um, gold tooth, and um, my brother Mickey, who was uh, white, my sister and I, I mean, even though we were living in Berkeley, nobody looked like us on our block. And um, my mother, who had been a waitress for many years, became a realtor. Uh, she and my father met at a um, SWP meeting, I think, in San Diego, and they moved up here. And um, my mother uh, studied and became a real, a real estate broker and soon owned her, owned her own firm. And people used to say that it was more like a movement than a, um, than a real estate office. And she fought very hard um, in uh, housing rights and getting rid of redlining. And I've met many people uh, that I've grown up with who she was responsible for people um, black people being able to buy their homes in Berkeley, and she also got, um, I think, was the first to integrate uh, communities like San Leandro. So my mother was doing work with the Black Panther Party, and I didn't know it. And I, um, I was, I'd say I was pretty apolitical. There was on Shattuck Avenue, there was a Black Panther Party office that's right across from La Pena. And right next to it was the uh, AJ's Artistic Fingers, which is where all the pimps and hustlers used to get their hair done. And my, and my mother owned that building, and I used to walk across the street so that I wasn't um, be <laughs> accosted by any of the pimps or hustlers and AJ's Artistic Fingers. And I felt intimidated, totally intimidated, <laughs> by the Panthers that were right next door. And um, I had been going to school in... Uh, Oregon at the time and came home for Christmas break and um, my mother announced that Huey Newton was going to be coming to um, brunch. 
Now, as a little bit of a backdrop, I grew up on Bateman Street. I don't know if anybody in here is familiar with that street. We crossed out the E and made it Batman Street. And um, <laughs> on that one block, there was um, Tom Hayden and Ann Shear, Ann Wiles next door. Before Tom lived there, it was um, Bob Shear. He then moved down the street. There was Blue Fairyland, and um, let me see who. Um, Blue Fairyland, there were um, political education classes and Jane Fonda, and it was kind of a hotbed for political activity, certainly in Berkeley, and that was kind of the backdrop that I grew up in. And um, so the summer before, when I had gone to school, I mean, gone away to college, um, I remember that some folks on the block, my parents were out of town at Astorwood, we housed some panthers that were on their way out um, um, out of the country and I I was I was a pretty naive um, even though my mother was very very political she we were pretty shielded as kids my sister and I and the thought of that was just horrifying no but um, when I grew when I went away to school uh, Anne gave me a dashiki that was Eldridge Cleaver's and um, before, that year, that summer, uh, Huey was released from prison, and I went to see him at the um, city hall in Oakland. And remember him standing with that famous picture of him standing on top of the the Volkswagen with David Hilliard with his his uh, chest bare. And then off to school I went. Well, I, that so I came back that that Christmas, and um, my mother had Huey there for brunch and. Kind of the rest is history. I went back and packed up my clothes and moved back here and joined the Black Panther Party um, a couple of months later. So I was a rank and file member of the party. This is someone who was, I was not political. As a matter of fact, that morning I didn't even know what to ask Huey. I mean, there were all of these students, and maybe some of you were in that room from Cal, and they were asking him all these very deep intellectual questions, and I I didn't know what to ask him, and I just asked him, um, so what was it like in prison? And I was um, kind of moved by his response, which was, um, you know, he just looked at me and he said it was really lonely. And it was something about his, his um, vulnerability and his honesty and lack of pretense that just kind of caught me off guard, and I've kind of been off guard for <laughs> since. <laughs> And um, so <clears throat> I was a rank and file member of the party and I worked in the school for most of the time that I was in the party, worked on the newspaper with Erica Huggins and Elaine uh, and worked to help the cl clinic get started, the George Jackson People's Free Health Clinic on Adeline. And I, I worked alongside um, young men, very young people, and I think the oldest in that party at that time was 32, and um, work with people who just side by side would give their lives for each other. I remember we just lived on edge because we never knew when there was going to be a, a raid and, or, um, yeah, and many members, I think about 28 had been murdered during that time, and it was, um, you know, it was terrifying. And we were just kids, and we just didn't really know the de actually the degree of um, war that was being waged on us. I um, so I left the party a couple of years later and went went away to school. And Huey and I were kind of like moths to flame to flame for many years. And we didn't get married until I was 30, 32, I think, many years later. And um, I kind of like to fast forward. I, what I'm doing now is I've had a foundation. David Hilliard and I started it in 1993, I think it was. I had all of the archives from the party that Huey had left to me. And we got them um, there at Stanford University. And David, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty introverted person, I'll have good ideas and let somebody else take. It was kind of a good marriage. I'd have some of the ideas and David was front and center for many years and he became ill and was uh, unable to um, do 
do what he needed to do with that foundation to make it continue to work. We pu published, we published many of Huey's books and um, did a lot of good work. And it became clear that if I wanted this work to continue, that if I wanted the party's legacy to be remembered, and um, and that this that I that I had to do more than what I was doing, and that's just happened in the last three three four years, where the far, the the foundation was in um, we were out of compliance. I had to work really hard to restructure the board and get the get it up and running. And now my focus is to get the get the 13 years of the Black Panther Party newspaper digitized and indexed so that it's available to people, because that's where the real history lies. And, and where it is now, it's they're, they're digi you can get digitized copies, but you can't index them, so it's very hard to do research. And the papers and all of our history that's at Stanford University is impossible to access. So that's kind of my work now at 66 years old. I want to retire and really focus on um, getting, making sure that that history is accessible to all of who wants to study it. And um, so that's about it. I don't have any answers. I loved it when Mr. Coyote was talking about um, not actually defecting from the community in which you're trying to represent or work towards. And Huey did an article called On the Defection of the Black Panther Party, I think, in the black community, and where we would show up to church and curse and, um, and really alienated ourselves from the very community who we loved. So I think that that's one of the things that I've thought about throughout the years is um, how, how, I would, how I would do it differently. Um, but, you know, youth is kind of wasted on the young. <laughs> and, um, so I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. I'm David Goins. I'm a printer and <clears throat> graphic designer here in Berkeley. In October of 1964, I and seven other students at the University of California were expelled for having participated in illegal activities concerning the First Amendment. And you'd think that eight students of the university, eight, eight non-students of the university against the University of California system State of California, Alameda County Sheriffs, Berkeley Police, the Oakland Police, and the FBI. It would be an unequal contest, and you'd be right, they didn't have a chance. <clears throat> you know. um, the, uh, my next activity was to go to Bogalusa, Louisiana, get chased around by the Ku Klux Klan, and get pulled out by the FBI, <clears throat> just ahead of us being killed. Uh, James Farmer, myself, and Jack Weinberg were escorted out of the state by the FBI. Got back just in time to go to jail for the FSM, and that was the very first day of the anti-war movement in Berkeley. By then, Berkeley had become the place to go for people who were protesting pretty much anything. Um, <clears throat> the anti-war protest and its successes, the free speech movement and its successes, taught us here in Berkeley one thing, we could do anything. When Alice Waters opened Chez Panisse, she had no restaurant experience and had never done any commercial cooking, and had no money. And this brings, us, brings me to the point that I want to make. What we had done in the 1960s was not so much as change society, we built a community. Before the free speech movement, the anti-war movement, the HUAC protests, there wasn't really a community. There was town and gown. You went here for four years and you graduated and you never came back. After the activities of the 1960s, 1960s, we had a community. And what the community did was it supported its own. Alice Waters opened her restaurant with no knowledge. The first night was a la plus grande disaster. And everybody kept coming back. The work I do as a graphic designer and a printer is supported by the community. And without the community, neither Alice nor I would have amounted to a hill of beans. This is the first community. One of the reasons Berkeley is so great is because it is a community. It works together on things. 
and we created that. We thought we were changing society, and we were, except we were changing our society. We changed Berkeley. We made Berkeley into what it is today. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ken Brower. I, um, I really like the prompt that, uh, that Malcolm gave us in the beginning. He, he said, you're, um, you're leading Polynesia on your canoe. Uh, you, you're, you're atoll in Polynesia. Um, and he, he's got this information that they took 24 items with them to Hawaii when they went. So what, what would you take with you on your canoe from the 60s? And what would you um, leave behind? And I, I really like that, that prompt because I... I've actually traveled in, in voyaging canoes and it, uh, written about them, uh, uh, so I know something about that part. Um, uh, not the double canoes of the Polynesia, but the outrigger canoes of Micronesia, which are actually much better boats and um, were the best boats in the Pacific. But, but um, the other question he asked was, uh, well, one of the things he suggested, well, what, what would you want to bring along? And one of the things he said is courage. And I really think that that is, that is the one thing I'd want to bring from what we had in the 60s. Um, my own take on it was through the environmental movement because my dad, the namesake of this building, was was a very persuasive man and he drafted anybody in sight into his movement. He was a, he, he would evangelize everyone. That at our family dinner table, you know, no group was too small for him to evangelize. And um, <laughs> poor little, four little kids at his, his table. So, um, what he, what he saw was that, uh, and before almost anybody else, uh, as the first ED of the Sierra Club, was all these causes are connected. Uh, he was the first person to say that social justice is connected with environment. Uh, nuclear weapons are, convected, are connected with it. Everything ties into this movement. The other thing he, he believed was that, um, was that this was the movement, his movement, this was the movement we absolutely had to get right. Because none of the others would succeed if we didn't have a place to live in the universe. And um, there's gonna be no uh, civil rights, there's gonna be no justice, no um, gay rights, no music, no anything on a dead planet, was his argument. And, and uh, peace maybe, maybe you'd have peace on a dead planet, <laughs> finally, you know, the, 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 peace, the peace movement would finally succeed if the planet's dead, but, but, um, but everything, Everything depends on this, and um, he was very persuasive. So I, um, th uh, this was the movement I wanted to join. Um, I, I'm like everybody else on this stage. Um, when I, my, my wife Marion was, um, was the um, secretary of the black, black veterans at, um, at Merritt College, one of the groups that morphed into the Black Panthers, and, and, um, and uh, and Huey came by my, the Hortons' house, my in-laws. I, I met you at Boson's Locker many years ago in the 60s. And um, I know the story from my in-laws about how, how he, when Huey left the house, he had to, um, he always had to look up and down the street because the police were going to pick him up. So we had to be, make sure there were no police cars because he got harassed at that period. So, so, um, so I thought that was all very interesting. And, and I was all for him. But my idea was that I had to pick one movement, and this is the one I would pick. And, um, and the courage part, I, I just remember, I just remember, I remember the, the enthusiasm at the beginning of the environmental movement. It began, the modern movement really began in, in Berkeley and the Bay Area. The whole environmental movement began there. And in the, in the beginning of the 60s, it was conservation. We called it the conservation movement. By the, by the, at the beginning of the 70s, it had become the environmental movement, much larger, um, not just concerned with wild lands, but everything. And, um, and, and I just remember the, you know, there's a glow, there's a glow at the birth of anything um, that eventually fades. And, and, and that's, the, that's what I hope there's some way to, to avert. Because I just remember the joy in combat in those days. It was a kind of naivete, those first victories in the environmental movement, nobody believed they could do. My dad stopped the Bureau of Reclamation from building dams and Dinosaur National Mon Monument. It was really the first time a citizen group had stopped a big government project. 
And everybody <laughs> thought, well, hey, smooth sailing. And we, we, we launched all the, um, the 60s really launched all the, all the things that happened in the 70s, the EPA, the Endangered Species Act, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, um, uh, the Wilderness Spill, um, all these things that came on so fast now, in retrospect, it looks, it looks so good. We, it, we, really, we really were rolling. And, and I think people thought then we could do anything. And, and it, it lost its glow. Um, the, the opposition learned learned how to counteract us. They, they co-opted our language. They, they began to adopt greenwashing, where, they, where you know, Standard Oil would claim to be a great environmental organization. And, and they have wonderful ads that would convince you. And, and, and the other thing that happened is you're a victim of your success. You, you become a big, like the Sierra Club, a big, my dad was only the second full-time employee when he became the ED. You become big, you, you need managers, uh, the fire in the belly guy sort of um, wants to get some money and raise some kids. Uh, the manager comes in. Pretty soon you need corporate people on your boards. Uh, the, the movement loses its, loses its original fire. And, and the, my question is that, 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 that glow at the birth of something, how do you, how do you resurrect that? That's, that's what we, we need to bring with us, I think. Um, the thing to leave behind, um, uh, I want to do one thing of each. I think rapaciousness. Um, very interesting, the parable of what happened in Hawaii. The double canoes went to Hawaii with those 24 items, these Polynesians who colonized Hawaii. With a very short time, uh, they had destroyed, they had extinguished 57 species of birds in the island to make feather capes for the Ali. The, the nobility. We don't need to do that. We don't need to feather the capes of our aristocracy anymore. Um, there's still old ladies in Hawaii who go down to the lava tubes to tend those capes. Um, uh, at least they were 20 years ago, the last I checked. But, but the parable of the, of the Polynesian Triangle is, is one to remember. The northern uh, tip of the corner of the triangle is Hawaii. Howleys, the white people, only destroyed 19 species after the, the Hawaiians, the original Hawaiians, destroyed 57. Um, the, uh, west, the western corner of Polynesia is, is New Zealand. The New Zealanders arrived, the Maoris arrived about the same time. They extinguished the moas. These gigantic uh, uh, ground birds grew 12 feet, 12 feet high. There were 12, more than a dozen species. And they were wiped out in a very short time by brown human beings. The th third triangle, the third corner of the triangle, is Easter Island. It's such a f fantastic parable, the more I think about it. But the, the, Easter, the eastern corner is Eastern Island. They used up all the wood, could build no more canoes, and couldn't go any further, and couldn't go back. So this is what, this is what we want to leave behind. That, um, that rapaciousness. Um, it's, what's, you know, it's what Google says, don't do evil. It's hard, as we found out from Google, not to do evil. Um, so let's not do evil in the next place we go. Good evening, family. How are you? Um, Arnold Perkins, um, it says community leader, which is I'm not. I'm a community steward and a community servant. So I always like to make that clear off the top. Um, look around, folks. Look around at each other. So this is a world that I spend a lot of time in. And it's a, and it's a very different world than, than my ordinary reality. Um, and so America means something different to me than it probably means to a lot of you. Um, so when I think about the 60s, I think about civil rights. Um, I think about the struggles that we had then, the struggles we have presently. Um, I think about how people, how the Native American people are still abused as we sit here tonight and we sit by and allow that to happen. Um, we see um, unfair treatment within our community 
today in the newspaper tomorrow how people are treated because of the color of their skin. Um, the darker you are, the more um, victimized you are liable to become. Um, we have people that we hold in high esteem like the Clintons. I hold them in very low esteem because of the omnibus crime bill and somehow uh, Bill Clinton is our savior, but the ominous crime, crime bill put most, more people of my color in prison than anyone else. We, we talk about Hillary Clinton, our goddess, who called us um, super predators. And somehow that expected to like go away and we're expected to be okay. Um, so um, I came to California from Florida, where if you were walking down the street and I was walking down the street, I'd have to get off the street and uh, you'd walk down the sidewalk, I'd have to get in the gutter and walk in the gutter until you pass. This is, this is my life. My life is sitting in the, in the back of the bus, hot as hell, and you sitting in the front of the bus. And first of all, I have to go get in the front of the bus, put my money in, go to the back door, get on the bus, if the bus driver doesn't drive off and leave me standing there. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm angry. I'm angry. But I'm always, and so that's my struggle. That's what I want to leave behind is the anger that I don't, I don't experience um, post-traumatic stress syndrome. I experience constant traumatic syndrome because of the microaggressions that happen. It, it, it's curious to me why this audience is the color it is. It, it, what it means is a lot of people get left out. Why they get left out, I'm not quite sure. Um, and I don't say what I'm saying to make people uncomfortable. I'm just talking about my truth and how I experience the world every day. Um, <clears throat> I'm also blessed uh, because I'm bicultural. I understand European culture quite well because I've had to spend most of my 77 years working in it, so I understand it really well but I also understand my, my African culture and my African heritage. So one of the things I would take on the boat is my culture, my few food, my music, my beautiful skin color that people spend hours in the sun trying to get like me. <laughs> it's so ironic. And then hate me. Um, I think that we have a lot of really good people who have supported Trump, really good people, good human beings, but they're so afraid of people of color coming in. There's thousands of people marching down the, the highway coming to take over America. And it's such bullshit because if it was a marathon, you might have candy bars here, you might have water there. These people have to travel long distances and they have nothing. But yet and still, we, we buy into these people are coming to I don't know what, <laughs> you know, they're going to they're take us over, they're going to, you know. And then we, we set up situations where we talk about inner city, which is a cold word. So I, let me say this and, and be done. So if I was living in Two Shoes, Montana, and we had 10 businesses, and Susie's Coffee Shop was one of those businesses. So we go in those businesses, in that Susie Club shop every day and talk about what's going on in town. And then slowly I see them close one by one by one. And as they're closing, I'm hearing the inner city people are getting, it's those inner city people, those immigrants are taking your whatever. And so eventually Susie's coffee shop closes. And then the, the, the big white savior comes along, Trump. And I'm gonna save you from those people. I'm gonna make America great again because there's those shithole people which is referring to me, people look like me. Those shithole people are taking your country from you. And he's been able to rally, the guy's a genius in terms of how he takes over the mind, just like Hitler. But he's an evil genius. And we need to be aware of it. And, and I think Peter uh, Cowdy talked about the, 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 the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party takes people of color for granted. The, and they focus on the urban area, but it's the, they need to get out, as we did in SNCC. I was in SNCC. I was in, 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 in Atlanta. 
We ask white people to leave SNCC and work with white people. And the Democrats need to leave the city, not totally, but and work in the rural area and work on other white people who are oppressing other white people. And the irony is, we're all in the same boat. If you're poor in Appalachia, you're poor in East Oakland, you're poor. And so I think our task is how do we bring people together, in spite of what I've just said, how do we bring people, it's, it's, it's always a um, dilemma. How do we bring people together to understand that we're experiencing the very same thing? I spent quite a bit of time in Cuba, going back and forth to Cuba, and they talk about solidarity, and we hear the word, we really don't know what it means. But, but what it means is, I am because we all are. I'm not in this by myself, and what we teach you in America is fierce independence. That's bullshit. You can do nothing by yourself, we are a social people, and we need to get away from this fierce in individual and this competitiveness. I got to take it from you. Now, how could I share it with you? My question is, how could I share it with you? So my personal struggle is being human. And I've let you into my soul. I'm trying to be human. I'm trying not to be angry at what I see every day when I'm at Juvenile Hall or when I'm at San Quentin. I'm trying not to be angry and be, and, and be just, oh, man. And, and, and it's reinforced over and over. And people say, you know, just calm down, be cool. How can you be calm down? If, if I was kicking you in the ass every day, you would pretty soon say, you know what? I can't be calm. I'm going to land the cut and I'm going to get you. <laughs> you know, and, and that's just my reality. So I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm hurt, I'm frustrated. Um, and yet and still, we are a better people, we're a better country, and we can do a lot more than we do. We talk a lot. My father's always said, when it's all said and done, more is said than it's done. And so I want to I want to implore you, I want to implore you to call somebody tonight, somebody tomorrow, and come together because we got to change this. Otherwise, we're all going to die. We're all going to, we're all suffering. You, you afraid to walk down the street and I walk by and you grab your purse. You know, that's the automatic way. Or I'm walking down the street at night and you kind of look askance. Well, that's a disease that we have. We're at dis-ease. And as a nation, we are diseased. So um, I'd like to leave in my canoe and leave all what I said behind. I really would. And I'd like to be able to walk about in this country and not go out to, to Lafayette or, or like Moraga in the evening and be paranoid, be afraid somebody's going to arrest my old ass. You know, and it might be, that's not rational. It is rational because it happens. So anyway, I've, I think I've said more than enough. Thank you much. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I guess I'm the cleanup hitter here. I have to end the game somehow. Um, I've been having various flashes of, I think, insight as I'm listening to all the people gathered here, wonderful group. Uh, there's an element that I, I feel uh, I kind of yearn for, and that is the, the, the trickster element and the, uh, um, that sort of yippy, that yippy spirit that used to always, uh, you know, be at, at protests and pulling pranks and organizing a demonstration to levitate the Pentagon, which they did, by the way, in case you didn't catch that. And, uh, you know, it, we, we got to keep laughing. We got to keep dancing and laughing and singing. Um, as for my, uh, what I'd like to bring with us is the spiritual revolution, which I think is really one of the most significant things that happened in the 60s, which was long before the, you saw mindfulness on the cover of Time magazine or, uh, you know, a yoga studio on every block. Uh, 
there was a, a search that a lot of people got involved in uh, for a different kind of identity, an identity that was inclusive of nature, inclusive of the world, inclusive of all other cultures, all other deities, every, everything thrown into the, into the pot. And it was all sacred in, in some way and, and holy. I mean, all of us here who've been talking about the 60s, no, there was no, there's not a thread of tie-dye on any of the people's uh, clothing, which makes me wonder if they're really talking about the 60s. <laughs> but um, in the late uh, 60s, I uh, went to Asia along with a great wave of young Westerners um, that turned out to be, I think, a... a, a a pilgrimage of historic proportions. Um, I, th I went to Asia and th I thought, well, I'll find a guru who will teach me how to merge with the cosmic oneness. And then my painful self-consciousness will disappear. The bliss will kick in. I, I thought it might take a couple months. <laughs> who, who knew, you know? Uh, but... Uh, there was a great emphasis on, on uh, merging with the cosmic oneness. It may have had something to do with the drugs, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could take LSD and see that everything was one pulsing, breathing, vibrating, living thing. And you were part of that. I remember uh, many times standing in a little stoned circle of people and somebody would say, well, man, everything is everything. <laughs> Which was a conversation stopper for sure, you know. <laughs> Once you say everything is everything, uh, no further distinctions can be made. <laughs> and it's true. Everything is everything. And vice versa. <laughs> everything is everything for better or for worse. Everything is everything on some level anyway. Everything is just a play of shadow and light. Everything is everything morning, noon, and night. Plato said we live in a world of illusion, in a cave of illusion. The Taoist wonders, am I awake or in a dream? Einstein said, he came to this conclusion, he said, this matter is not what it seems. And everything is everything. Everything is poetry and physics, say the poets and the mystics. It's in space-time, it's all in your mind. It's what you believe, it's the dance of Shiva, the veil of Maya, the net of Indra, it's the robes of the prophet, it's all made out of the same cloth. It's electrical, chemical. AC and DC, and E equals MC squared, and MC squared equals E. E, 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 E. It's quarks, leptons, gluons, meons, and muons for eons and eons. <laughs> Through a telescope or a microscope, it's all the same by any name, the macro or the micro, the sky above, the mud below, it's all one. And there ain't nothing new under the sun. And if you're on a spiritual path trying to get to the one, Maybe you better do your math, because if everything is everything, you're already done. <laughs> and everything is. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, body and soul, birth, death, all the rest. Everything is the United American Amalgamated Corporation Incorporated. Everything is perfect in its imperfection. In all the ten directions, everything is a metaphor for everything else. Everything is you. You are part of the song. You are the next verse. You are fill in the blank. So that's, that's what I want to, I want to bring a little uh, trickster back into the, uh, uh, the conversation. And uh, uh, thanks to Abby Hoffman for uh, being, being such a leader. Okay, and thanks all, all of you guys. And women.
do people have a single thought? It's so disperse, it's so marvelous, it's so engaged. I love the engagement of people. And I think what we have to do is be engaged. I think, for me, mention was made of the levitation of the Pentagon. I was there. <laughs> and it levitated me, because what I was doing was I was walking along, there were all these characters with, with bayonets pointed at me. And I looked at these kids and I thought, these are not the enemy. These are the kids that grew up watching the Howdy Doody show with me. These are the kids that went to the first grade, read Dick and Jane with me. These are the kids that I knew. These were not the enemy. And I think the enemy is, I think what we have to do is liberate our imaginations. We have to think beautiful thoughts. We have to act on those beautiful thoughts. And I, and I suggest that we go off and figure out how to do it. We've got various people in this room that I think everybody ought to meet. And beside the panelists, I think we've got people like Lee Swenson, we've got people like Ed Rosenthal, we've got various people like, so my wonderful friend Richard Burmack wrote a book about the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Do people remember the veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade? I do too. When I came to Berkeley, they were strong. They're now all gone. I think we're the veterans of the 60s. And I think we owe it to the world to tell our story straight, to figure out what was the essential part of it all. And I think we changed a lot. I figure out what we have to do is figure out how to pass along that sense of change and how to, and how to reduce the egotism, how to reduce the conspicuous consumption, how to reduce the delusions, and how to get at the core of what we did that was so fucking beautiful, you could just die for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Freddie and David and Ken and Fry, especially to Fry for being the inspiration for the evening and Barbara for uh, introducing the California Institute for Community Art and Nature to Fry and to Arnold Perkins and Scoop Nisker on, on our previous panel, all icons of um, canoe paddling. And um, I guess we've, we've got, uh, I want to thank everybody and the, the volunteers from the California Institute for Community Art and Nature, all the volunteers who helped make this event happen today, please stand up. We had a whole group of students from UC Berkeley, uh, from Mills College. There are actually more than two people here under 60. Um, and uh, where's Lisa? Lisa, uh, Lisa O'Reilly, Associate Director of the Center. Max Bramer, uh, Julani, Julani Freitas, who's the extraordinary volunteer with the clipboard, Beyond Belief, and everyone else in the team that helped make it happen today. Please, there's more food, there's more to drink. Um, come and mingle as much as you can and carry on the conversation. And thanks so much for coming. We'll be back in touch. <laughs>